I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Carrie Pimplot. Uh, Carrie is an assistant professor of African American and Diaspora Studies and History at the University of Wyoming. She received her uh, bachelor's degree with first class honors in American Studies at King's College London. She earned her PhD in History at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Her research interests uh, include African American social movements, black nationalism and radicalism, and religious cultures and institutions. Dr. Pimblot's um, last book is entitled Between the Bible and the Gun in Little Egypt, Black Power and Black Theology. Um, and I always want to say Cairo, but it's Cairo. That's how they say Cairo, Illinois, 1969 to 1974. Kerry teaches courses in Introduction to American, African American Studies, African American History, the African Diaspora, Black Freedom Movements, and the Black West. And today we have the privilege of learning from her expertise in her presentation entitled, Tithes and Offerings for Black Power. So, Kerry? You're good. So when I was writing this, I took a little bit of a detour. So we are going to talk about uh, tithes and offerings for black power. Uh, but in uh, the first two thirds of my paper, I'm going to talk about a few other issues too. Um, and I will close out on a discussion um, of the role that white churches played in funding the black power movement. So histories of the African American experience often play social movements at center stage. From slave uprisings and mid-century civil rights campaigns, like the ones you see photographed here, to the contemporary Black Lives Matter movement, instances of black collective action and organized protest are seemingly ever-present in the stories we tell. As a result, you could be forgiven for thinking that social movements are normal, commonplace occurrences in which the majority of people participate at some point in their lives. But that's simply not the case. In fact, what we refer to as social movements, those non-institutionalized discourses and practices of change, are far from common or routine. Over the past several decades, scholars in the field of social movement theory, which is a field that I work in, uh, have elaborated a number of ingredients uh, that they view as being essential to the development of effective social movements. And these ingredients include things like optimal political opportunities. And so you might think here, for example, of the presence of a president or another agent of the state who is willing to work with or partner or negotiate with social movement activists. It's definitely what we see with John F. Kennedy in the 1960s. Or it might be a moment of national prosperity, a moment in which the fiscal uh, demands of protesters can actually be met by the state. Uh, that makes a movement more likely to take place and be successful. Movements also need ample resources. Perhaps they need technical expertise, legal and lobbying skills, or simply the organizational and financial resources necessary to hold meetings, print flyers, and provide bail bond if their activists get incarcerated. And of course, movements need people. People willing to break the regular pattern of everyday life, to mass mobilize around a grievance, to correct it. In this sense, social movements are actually extraordinary events. They're creations that require great human skill and sacrifice to build, as well as a little luck and good timing to win. And so I'm a historian of social movements. I study the struggles of working class people and people of color to transform the world they occupy and render it more just, more democratic, and more human. I'm interested in how people with relatively few institutional or economic resources mobilize to take on structures and agents of tremendous power. I'm perhaps most interested in how these agents of change are made, since we know that they're not born. What cultural forces or historical processes or perhaps lived experiences converged to shape their consciousness in such a way that they were hurled into the types of fearless speech and radical sacrifice that are central to the development of effective social movements? I'm interested in how they sustain these struggles and their own involvement in them against the greatest odds and over what the labor activist and educator Miles Horton referred to as the long haul entire lives devoted to social justice and the promotion of meaningful change through struggle. 
Finally, I'm interested in understanding how their collective efforts have served to broaden and, now, and deepen our notions of democracy. A democracy that's not satisfied with merely casting a ballot at election time, but rather a more radical vision of democratic participation in which we're all actively and creatively involved in the process to transform our political, social and economic affairs. I study these movement people and the struggles they forged because they offer us important lessons that are still very much needed in our historical moment. And this moment is one that often gets talked about as a post-civil rights moment, a moment where apparently poverty, sexism, homophobia and racism are not as pertinent. Uh, and actually it's a very strong colorblind kind of language for the time. But actually those realities continue to powerfully shape the opportunities and lived experiences of people in the society. And importantly, these movements, they really offer us a sense of the value of democratic participation and collective engagement, the very keys to social transformation, values that in our own society have often been supplanted by individualism, social isolation, and a consumer-based identity as opposed to a citizen-based one. So my current research focuses on the black power movement of the late 1960s and early 1970s um, in this city, Cairo, Illinois. It's a small town uh, that you can see uh, drawn here at the intersection of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. Um, I became interested in this town uh, for a number of reasons about 10 years ago. Uh, but perhaps the most important reason was that Cairo activists seemed to defy all of the odds by building a movement in a time of few political opportunities and with very limited resources. Despite these enormous challenges, Cairo emerged as the focal point for black power struggles after 1970, and its leader, who's photographed here with Rosa Parks, became a national icon, who was very well known at the time. His name is Reverend Charles Cohen. At a time when other black power radicals were being jailed, sent into exile, or slain at the hands of law enforcement, Cohen and the Cairo movement were just getting started in 1970. Accordingly, for many activists, this movement represented a beacon of hope on an otherwise bleak political landscape. And, by all accounts, the 1970s was a bleak political landscape that presented less than optimal political opportunities to activists fighting for racial justice. The heroic phase of the modern civil rights movement had passed, and despite securing a number of legislative victories at the federal level, and you'd be thinking here of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and then of course uh, Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty Initiative, uh, the national mood towards black uh, freedom struggles was quickly souring. Shortly after the Cairo movement began in 1969, Richard Nixon was elected to the White House on a campaign platform that appealed to the so-called silent majority of white Americans tired of protests and urban rebellions and desirous of the imposition of law and order. What Nina Simone would call the backlash blues were also felt in Illinois, where the governor's office was controlled by an unsympathetic Republican, Richard Ogilvy, and at the local level, Cairo's county and municipal leadership was dominated by outspoken white supremacists, many of whom simultaneously served as leaders in a 2,000-strong chapter of the White Citizens' Council. This White Citizens Council organization, they circulated these little bumper stickers here, uh, had a, a real aim of maintaining the racial status quo in Cairo, which I'll describe to you in a second. But in total in this period, somewhere between about one third and one half of everybody who was white in Cairo joined the White Citizens Council. And this really made like the Cairo White Citizens Council uh, a really important hub in this part of the United States for regional white supremacist activities. During this period, uh, the early 1970s, members of organized white supremacist groups like the American Nazi Party, uh, imaged here, or citizens councils from maybe across the US South, and then also the John Birch Society, they attended protests in Cairo in large numbers, uh, and they also participated in vigilante violence against African Americans who lived in this community. So very simply here, just wanted to say that Cairo is not the ideal place to be building a black power struggle. It's a place where political opportunities are extraordinarily narrow. If this political landscape was bleak, the economic conditions were even worse in Cairo. The post-war era of so-called national prosperity was drawing to a close. The first signs of urban capital flight and deindustrialization were becoming visible across the Rust Belt. 
An oil embargo loomed on the horizon, and support for this war on poverty and other federal programs designed to address economic inequality were dwindling. In Cairo, however, none of these developments were actually new. The politics of abandonment and dispossession had been visible for many decades. The city, uh, Cairo, reached its peak in the late 19th century. And during this period, it was a leading transshipment hub uh, for the shipment of commodities north to south and east to west. During this time of relative prosperity at the end of the 19th century, the city's large black population, and actually, which was pretty consistently around 30 to 40% of Cairo's entire population, um, its large black population gained access to solid working class jobs, working on the river, the railroad, and also in small scale manufacturing. With their new disposable incomes, African American workers counteracted a very rigid system of Jim Crow segregation in Cairo by building their own separate public sphere uh, devoted to African Americans, and it included a whole range of institutions, uh, beginning with churches but expanding to include schools, separate barbershops, restaurants, grocery stores, political clubs, labor unions, newspapers, and even an opera house. And so this late 19th century black public sphere was very robust. African Americans to build this public sphere paid a double tax. They at once paid for the development of separate white institutions through the public sphere, and then they also paid additional money to build their own separate black institutions that they could use. However, during the early 20th century, the city was devastated by a rapid decline in river transportation, as well as a failure to attract large-scale manufacturing in a way that maybe other river cities like St. Louis or Pittsburgh or Cincinnati were able to achieve. And when the Great Depression struck in 1929, Cairo's small manufacturing sector was slashed in half, a collapse from which the city simply never recovered. At the time of Charles Cohen's birth, the leader of the Cairo Black Power struggle, he was born in 1945, Cairo was in dire financial straits. It was a city kept afloat almost entirely by federal aid. Cairo quickly earned the ignoble reputation for being the Deep South City of the North. White city leaders chose to respond to this economic crisis by scrambling to keep the breadcrumbs for themselves. And so what they did is they locked blacks out of the political system entirely. In fact, there were no African Americans elected to political office despite the large scale of their population for almost 60 years. They strengthened Jim Crow segregation in all public accommodations, and they enforced practices of employment discrimination that kept African Americans on the bottom rung of the economy. And Cohen came of age in this apartheid-like society. He was raised in poverty by his mother, Naomi Bondurant, who worked as a domestic laborer in the homes of wealthier white residents. Naomi's home was located here. It was actually uh, in a recently constructed public housing project called the Pyramid Courts, specifically designated for Cairo's black and poor residents. At the same time that this pyramid course was created in 1941, uh, they also built uptown another housing project called Alnwood Place, and this was designated for white working class people. Uh, the Alnwood projects were constructed out of brick, and they were built in a, a higher elevation where they were protected from flooding. And the pyramid courts was located actually on the exact same site as a former contraband camp, a camp where African enslaved people had escaped to uh, during the Civil War era. Um, and they were constructed out of wood and in the middle of a floodplain. So in addition to growing up in, in this environment here, Charles also attended separate black schools, including Washington Junior High and Sumner High, which is photographed here where black teachers received lower salaries uh, and classrooms were hopelessly overcrowded, though I should say black teachers of the kind like Hattie Kendrick, a lady I study, uh, had a valiant attempt at providing good education to people like Charles Cohen. As a teenager, Cohen's leisure activities were restricted to the upper decks of the Rogers Theater and swimming in the nearby uh, Mississippi River because they were prohibited access as African Americans from the Cairo swimming pool became a very significant site of struggle during the civil rights and black power period. As he reached the end of his school years, Cohen entered a workforce where black workers were consigned to low skill and low paid employment as janitors, domestic workers, and seasonal farm workers in the cotton fields that surround Cairo. And this image here, uh, three photographs of different kinds of employment uh, that were present in Cairo in the 50s and 60s, you get a sense of just how rigid that color line was. Blacks were largely locked out of uh, clerical positions, um, locked out of any decent paid positions within the 
community, including federal uh, jobs like in the postal service. Though segregation and discrimination had always existed in Cairo, what distinguished Cohen's epoch from those that preceded it was the black Cairoites who had borne the brunt of the financial collapse in the early 20th century now found it almost impossible to sustain a separate black public sphere capable of insulating black youth like Cohen from racism's effects. Gone were black newspapers, labor unions, businesses, and cultural institutions that had all flourished in the earlier decades. And gone also was a black middle class, which largely left the city uh, during the 1930s and 40s. In the face of skyrocketing black unemployment and declining incomes, only the most vital black institutions could survive. And those were really black funeral parlors and black churches. I think I was initially drawn to Cairo uh, for this reason. As someone uh, myself who grew up in a town that was devastated by the impact of late 20th century deindustrialization and corporate disinvestment, that's my hometown over there, Stoke-on-Trent, it was the home of the pottery industry for about three centuries, uh, but now is uh, very high unemployment. Most of those companies have left the country. Cairo was a place that felt very familiar but at the same time, radically different than my own experience. Building a social movement in this kind of community felt impossible. The political opportunities and resources that scholars tell us are absolutely essential to mounting successful campaigns were seemingly absent in the communities we grew up in. And in Cairo, African-American activists like Cohen faced the double threat of racial discrimination and exploitation, something I had not had to navigate in my own community. And yet Cohen, and many like him, devoted their lives to a concerted struggle to dismantle Jim Crow and promote greater political, social, and economic empowerment for black people. And so I asked, how did they do it? This is really the focus of my book in many ways, which comes out this fall, which is a shameless plug. Um, how did they build a movement against the greatest odds and over the long haul? How do they mount struggles in places where allies are few and the prospects for success seem non-existent? How do you build a movement in hard times and hard places? And that's going to be the focus for most of my presentation today. So studying Cairo's really taught me three important things about how people build movements in places where the odds are stacked against them. First, if we go back to this slide here, which is my recipe for a social movement, um, we'll take a little look here that while Cairo did, did not have optimal political opportunities and it didn't have ample resources, it did have people, human agency. And people like Cohen, who lived under this system of racial apartheid, and they grieved it. And it's important for us to recognize that people are somewhat independent variables. Uh, they often choose to act despite the lack of political opportunities and resources. In fact, a sociologist, Alden Morris, who I really like, he's got a great book out right now on W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, basically arguing that Du Bois uh, was the founder of American sociology. Uh, but Alden Morris argues, uh, quote, enormous collective action can burst forth precisely when the political authorities close ranks and when heavy repression is unleashed. And Cohen did just this. Uh, he decided to build a new movement organization in Cairo at the exact moment that national politics took a rightward shift. In fact, he describes the formation of this organization, a group that was called the Cairo United Front, as an act of self-defense, stating in his autobiography that it was, quote, black unity or black annihilation. Under Cohen's leadership, the United Front announced an economic boycott of discriminatory white businesses in the downtown district and staged daily picket lines downtown. And these were often led by African-American women and children uh, from the Pyramid Housing uh, Project. At the same time, United Front leaders began to create plans for the rebuilding of the black public sphere. And that new public sphere, they claimed, was going to include black-owned and operated newspapers, shopping centers, daycare facilities, legal aid services, housing developments, farms, and adult education services. Very ambitious. And so Cohen and other black Cairo whites acted. They used their human agency in spite of the odds they face. And so that was really the first lesson that I learned. The second lesson the Cairo story teaches us is that every community, no matter how poor or marginalized, has resources. We just have to look in the right places for them. 
African Americans in Cairo did not have a robust black business class with the finances to underwrite their social movement. Nor did they have an abundance of black politicians, uh, professionals or lawyers capable of lobbying on their behalf through established electoral means or through the court system. They also didn't have powerful black labor unions like you might find in Detroit, capable of galvanizing black workers at the point of production, using the strike as a strategy to affect change. In fact, most of the indigenous resources that powered black power struggles in other communities, they are notably absent in Cairo. But what small town black Cairo whites did have were their tight social networks and their churches, which were among the last surviving black institutions in Cairo. And these churches became the heart of this particular black power struggle. On one level, they provided very tangible resources vital to the daily operations of the United Front. And these could be very straightforward things like office space. At this point in history, it would have been a mimeograph machine, um, a meeting hall. Uh, they provided these very practical organizational resources that made this movement possible. But churches also provided other less tangible resources essential to mobilizing local people into the movement and ensuring that they stay committed to that movement even when times got hard. Churches provided a ready-made leadership of preachers, deacons, and elders capable of galvanizing members into action through their use of fiery rhetoric and charismatic sermonizing. In their sermons, ministers like uh, Reverend Blaine Ramsey, photographed here, provided congregants with this sense of transcendent motivation for participating in the struggle. They connected their own fight for racial justice to a longer big, biblical history in which God always found himself sided on the side of the poor and oppressed. And then as well, these churches had uh, a very, very strong culture, a religious culture that was centered on gospel music, uh, the tradition of witnessing and testifying and call and response oratory that bow movement participants together and solidified their resolve to continue. What you might have noticed from some of these photographs is that by centering their black power struggle in churches, local activists ensured the broadest possible participation in the struggle, bridging divisions based on class, gender, and generation. So what emerges from these photographs is a representation of black power that rubs uneasily against many of our assumptions. This portrayal of black power isn't narrowly centered on African-American inner city youth. They're certainly here, but it also includes their mothers, their grandmothers, and their children. It's also a deeply religious movement that hasn't jettisoned the Christian moorings of its earlier civil rights phase. In Cairo, such a move would have jeopardized their access to the very resources essential for their survival and the building of a successful movement. But what perhaps is most interesting is that Cairo's unique decision to build their movement on the foundations of the black church also won them some very powerful but often forgotten allies who were willing to extend new and additional resources. And this leads me to my last lesson offered by the Cairo movement. And this lesson really is that creating allies is vital when building movements in hard times and hard places, but that it often comes with a cost. While local churches offered valuable resources to sustain the United Front's economic boycott, building a whole new black public sphere was going to take a lot of outside funding. And this really becomes the United Front's central focus. And so for this, the United Front looked to the nation's predominantly white denominations for financial support. The nation's churches had, of course, been very prominent in supporting earlier civil rights campaigns. And so you may be familiar that leading white ministers were very involved in the Selma campaign. And then also the National Council of Churches, there's good scholarship on this, were very involved in lobbying around the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act. After the urban rebellions of the mid-1960s, church executives actually committed to deepen their involvement, saying that they were going to make significant financial resources available to local communities to help rebuild after the urban crisis. But by the late 1960s, not much had come of these declarations. This inactivity prompted some black power leaders, uh, James Foreman most notably, to seize the pulpit at Riverside Church in New York in May 1969 and deliver a black manifesto demanding $500 million in reparations from the nation's leading denominations for their role in slavery and in promoting racial discrimination. And this pressure applied by black power activists as well as black clergy within these predominantly white denominations had a really big effect that's not being acknowledged by scholars and is one of the focal points of my book. 
During the late 1960s and early 1970s, nearly all of the mainline denominations created grant awarding programs aimed at addressing poverty and racial inequality in the nation's cities. And the largest of these programs, just in case any of you are members of mainline denominations and you're curious about what they were, um, the Episcopal Church launched a program called the General Convention Special Program, uh, which had a large amount of money uh, that they committed to local struggles. If you're a Presbyterian, uh, your program was the National Committee on the Self-Development of People, uh, the largest grant awarding program created by any uh, mainline denomination. And then also all of these denominations got together, uh, including the Lutherans, um, some Jewish organizations also, um, and the United Church of Christ, and formed the Interreligious Foundation for Community Organizations that I'm going to refer to as IFCO. This is an extremely large, very powerful uh, church-based funder for black power struggles. All of these programs were headed by African-American clergy. And those clergymen were very committed to sponsoring community struggles for racial justice and empowerment. Um, and interestingly, not just black power struggles, Chicano rights struggles uh, and also American Indian struggles. And so even though they've been ignored by scholars, this is interesting, there's very little work on it, these groups award tens of millions of dollars to local movements during the late 1960s and early 1970s. I'm going to show you this piece here, give you a sense of the size uh, of the impact on my movement, the Cairo movement. So a relationship between the Cairo United Front and Charles Cohen and these church-based groups, it seemed very logical. Of course, the Cairo movement is a uniquely religious black power struggle. Um, and so many of these black clergy who headed these church-based organizations were very interested in getting involved and sponsoring the United Front to help them rebuild the black public sphere in Cairo. And between 1969 and 1974, just five years, the United Front applied to and received more than half a million dollars in grants from these national denominational sources. The largest donor being IFCO here, but you can see the scale of the donations by the Episcopal and Presbyterian Church too. And they use this money to launch an entire range of economic development projects that included a prefabricated housing factory, a cooperative market and store, a legal aid office, uh, the first legal aid office actually that provided free services to the poor in Cairo. Um, and in this context, these churches became really important allies uh, to the United Front and the black power struggle in the city. However, accepting this allyship also came at a cost. Church-based support tied the United Front to predominantly white denominations that were unstable and subject to the shifting sentiments of their own constituencies. Shortly after the creation of these grant awarding bodies, conservative white clergy and laity across the country lashed out against the use of denominational funds to sponsor what they perceived as controversial groups. Local bishops demanded the right to veto awards in their district. Parishioners withheld their tithes and offerings, and many abandoned mainline denominations entirely for more conservative and non-denominational alternatives. And in fact, I argue this is part of that move away from the mainline denominations that took place during the 1960s and 70s. Pressure also came from outside the church, as state agencies sought to stifle black power organizations by cutting off access to their funding sources. In the early 1970s, the IRS launched investigations into the National Council of Churches, IFCO, and more than a dozen other national church-based organizations for funding what they defined as subversive groups. Writing in April 1973, as you see here, Dean Kelly, an executive at the National Council of Churches, described these investigations as an unprecedented and aggressive move by the federal government to halt the work of religious groups engaging in, quote, dissident secular activities outside their walls. In 1972, the IRS Intelligence Division launched a major investigation into Charles Cohen's personal finances and filed summonses on all of the national denominations and ecumenical groups that had funded the Cairo United Front. Pressure also came, not just from the IRS, but from the FBI, whose director, J. Edgar Hoover, also expressed concern about the United Front's growing support from mainline churches. When Hoover discovered that the United Front was receiving significant donations from the Episcopal Church, he ordered agents in the Washington field office to launch a counterintelligence initiative aimed at, quote, having those funds cut off, and that's Hoover. 
Agents crafted a letter to an unidentified leader in the Episcopal Church, posing as a vestryman of one of the largest downtown Episcopal churches in Chicago. And in the letter, as you see a little quote from here, this supposed vestryman, who's actually an FBI agent from Washington, informed the reader that he was, quote, aware that the Episcopal Church had funded the United Front of Cairo to the sum of $50,000 for the year of 1970. These actions, he argued, had prompted many congregants to withhold their tithes and offerings. Accordingly, he asked the reader, quote, for the good of our church to withhold funds from the United Front of Cairo. These internal and external pressures on church executives resulted in a swift and precipitous decline in church-based funding for local black power initiatives. Rather than resisting, church executives opted to scale back financial commitments and eventually terminated grant awarding bodies entirely. As this graph shows, the impact of this decision in Cairo was devastating. I actually argue in my book that it's the single biggest factor that contributes to the decline of the movement in Cairo. The United Front was forced to halt the majority of its economic development initiatives and struggled to find the funding necessary even to maintain the daily operations of its group. In fact, many of its organization's members get incarcerated and cannot pay bail bond as a result. Within a year of being defunded by its church-based sponsors, the United Front had ceased to function as a mass movement, an exemplar of both the promises and perils of allyship. There's a lot more that I could say about the United Front today. I could tell you about the victories they did secure, and they were enormous. Victories that included the integration of all public accommodations in Cairo, uh, they also secured the first black elected officials to office uh, in more than 60 years. In fact, they just had their first black mayor recently. And the opening up of all municipal and county employment to African Americans where they'd been blocked out of those jobs in the past. This was all done by federal court order. I could also tell you about the limits of those struggles, how Cairo continued to face enormous economic challenges during the late 20th century, how its black working class faced skyrocketing unemployment, poor educational services, and growing criminalization and the new challenges of mass incarceration. But what I would like to close on today is a discussion of what the Cairo story teaches us, those of us who are most interested in building successful movements for social justice and racial change in the present. Cairo is a bellwether, I think. Its economic decline foreshadowed the more recent collapse of industrial hubs across the Rust Belt, and also in cities like mine, Stoke-on-Trent, in the United Kingdom. Those of us left behind to rebuild these post-industrial landscapes often find ourselves working in the narrowest political conditions and without the necessary resources we need. At times, we can feel tired, demoralized, and without hope. But what Cairo teaches us is that human beings are powerful and they have the agency to act even in hard times and the hardest of places. Our human agency, our consciousness and willingness to engage in fearless speech and acts of radical sacrifice. These are all independent variables that operate in spite of less than optimal conditions. Indeed, human beings are the unknown commodity in social movements. They can transform conditions with their very actions. They can produce new allies and resources where few were present before. And they can turn a political epoch on its head, creating new conditions and a possibility of a new world to come. I think that's what we're seeing in the Black Lives Matter movement today. Um, and I woke up this morning to news of the conflicts taking place in Chicago outside of Trump rallies, uh, where Black Lives Matter protesters have also been involved. This is really a movement that's working to address the multitude of ways in which black humanity is devalued, disrespected, and denied in our society. It's a movement born, much like the Cairo movement, as an act of self-defense, a movement that says it's black unity or black annihilation. And the use of this word, annihilation, is not hyperbolic. We're talking about the very literal annihilation of black men, women, and children at the hands of law enforcement, as well as the larger structural violence of racialized unemployment, community disinvestment, and incarceration. These two are dehumanizing acts. They deny people their chances to survive and thrive. They deny uh, that black lives matter every single day. Black Lives Matter, like Cairo, shows us that movements can emerge in the hardest of times and places. 
I also think that Cairo tells us that we need to look within our communities, no matter how fragmented, for signs of our hidden agency and resources. Sometimes we're so overwhelmed by the obstacles we face that we miss these vital free spaces where movement can happen and visions of a new world can be birthed. Sometimes we are rightly critical of these institutions, whether they be churches, mosques, unions, schools, civic societies. But the Cairo story teaches us that our autonomous institutions, those places where we build community with each other, free from outside pressures, these institutions are essential to our success. And I think in our historical moment, this is particularly important because we've witnessed an unprecedented assault on our collective public sphere. We have been forced out of our commons, so to speak. It often feels as though there are no places left for us to be together, grow together, and envision new ways of living and being. In fact, it often feels that the very simple human ties that bind us together have evaporated, that the community and institutional life has collapsed around us, and that we're left to our own devices, both literal and figurative. Cairo teaches us that we must rebuild these free spaces, these public spaces, these institutions where community and collectivity can actually happen. And we must ensure that these free spaces are equitable, democratic, and open to all people. And finally, the Cairo story teaches us of the promises and perils of allyship. Solidarity, as Cairo shows, can broaden political opportunities and expand the resources that we have available to us when we build movements. By working in allyship with each other, we can do, hypothetically at least, more than we can ever do separately. But allyship must be principled and must stem from a commitment to politically educate our own communities. While white church executives were initially willing to give tithes and offerings to the struggle for racial justice, they did so without ever really engaging their own constituencies. And when the cost became too high, they reneged upon their own promises and cast the Cairo movement back into isolation. For many black power activists, the moral of this story was that the future of all organizing would have to be independent of white support. But I think the moral of the story for all allies today, and at some point all of us serve as allies to somebody else's social movement, is that we really have to wrestle collectively with our place in these struggles. How our privilege in each new context shapes our role, and to ensure that our acts of solidarity are always principled, and that we too are willing to bear the burdens. Thank you. Please. Um, what in your research on the black movement, what lessons have you picked up that would be applicable to the plight of our Native Americans here in Wyoming? Wow, it's not a movement that I study, so it's a challenge for me to apply it, I'll be honest. It's not a movement that I'm actively engaged in, um, though I would be very interested. Um, I guess really these principles that I have put up at the beginning, the recipe for an effective social movement, there's a great deal of truth to them. They show you the limits of human agency, right? Which is that the most effective social movements do take place in times where you can find political allies, people that are willing to work with you at the highest levels of a community, whether that's a governor or whether it's a president or it's a, a, a Supreme Court that sides with your case. Um, and it also suggests that anything that people uh, within or outside those communities can do to expand their resource base is vital to the effectiveness of those movements. But, and I think that applies across the board, whether it's the movement you described or, um, or to any other. But I also think this question of human agency and the development of, of good strategies and tactics that are carefully attuned to the conditions in which you organize, um, that's what social movement theories and what the Cairo movement offers to us. Um, a sense that some strategies and tactics are more effective than others. They're capable of galvanizing people outside of your community and getting them actively involved. They're also capable of hitting people who are in power where it hurts, whether that's the pocketbook or their reputation, right? And so I think more broadly, the scholarship on social movements gives us some really good tools for understanding how we can organize effectively under the conditions we live in at any given moment but I'm sorry that it's not more specific than that okay please I would, um, I'm new to the community and I'd actually like to 
better understand his question, mm -hmm. what is the face change? Or what is the, the movement that, that he's referring to? Please. She's asking you if you could tell a little bit more about the nature of the, the social movements or struggles that are taking place with uh, American Indian uh, students and young people within this community. I don't think there is very much of a unified movement among Native Americans, um, primarily on the Wind River Reservation. Um, but it's clearly a, an issue for the state and for the rest of us here in the state. And I was hoping that some of the work you've been doing might give us some ideas of how things might develop on that front. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Please. In 1948, uh, then President Truman issued an executive order integrating the military. As this brought uh, black and white men and black and white men uh, <coughs> to live and eat and sleep with black and white mm -hmm. in the South with a great deal of attention. About 12 years later, we had the reunion of the Civil Rights Movement. I'm wondering if your work studied how that might have played into the Civil Rights Movement. Absolutely. Yeah, so in Cairo it does, I mean, I'll say more broadly at the national level, uh, the role of veterans um, and their experiences of fighting the double V, a war for victory against fascism overseas and a war against fascism in the United States, racial apartheid, um, was formative to the rise of the modern civil rights movement because at the psychological level, the sense of uh, being in a country where you were asked to sacrifice your life for the freedom of others and yet you did not have it yourself, uh, that is absolutely formative to people getting involved in struggles upon their return. Um, in Cairo, that's also the case. Um, and in 1945, actually, uh, at exactly the time we're talking about here, um, an individual is uh, lynched in a nearby town um, in Charleston, Missouri. It's about five miles away from Cairo. Um, and this becomes the triggering moment for civil rights activities in Cairo before the period I study, um, in which the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, begins to really begin its initial struggles against segregation and uh, forms of discrimination within their own community on a concerted basis. Um, so yes, many of the people that got involved with that movement were veterans, and they were also the wives of people that were returning from war. Um, and their struggle was one that was about creating an American democracy that was real, right? Uh, one in which these principles of kind of racial apartheid were no longer central and salient. That paradox would be exploded. Um, so yeah, in, in Cairo that's also the case. But I will say the Southern movement is so powerful uh, because of the role of veterans returning home with that paradox in mind, right? The paradox at the heart of American society, which is a society of freedom based on the enslavement and discrimination of others, right? So yes, please. How much of the black movement, which we've seen from the 60s forward in improving the lives of black people, it's not equal, mm -hmm. but it's getting there, how much of the Trump movement is now a backlash of any white movement? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I actually disagree with you on the first assertion here that it's getting better because I, I actually think that the conditions folks are living under today um, are vastly worse. Um, and I say this because of this argument about deindustrialization that I'm making, which is that our communities have imploded, right? Um, they've been completely disinvested in. Um, and the services that we have in those communities are very limited. And as a result, we have mass unemployment in some communities that the really only strategic response to has been criminalization and incarceration, especially of black and Latinos. Um, and so that's a real challenge, right? So the place that we live today, and I think the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, is really in response to this, what some scholars have called the new nadir, the new low point of African American history, which is that we're living through another nadir idea. The first one was when the, the most high rates of lynching took place in the United States during the early 20th century after the failure of Reconstruction. Um, and now we're seeing that again. If civil rights movement was our second Reconstruction, uh, you know, we're seeing now a backlash. And I think you're spot on, which is that really the kind of mobilization of white working class animosity towards um, kind of uh, scapegoating 
of people of color in the society for the challenge that white working class people have also faced as a result of deindustrialization um, is one that you're seeing with the Trump campaign. That it's being misdirected, it's not being organized towards a kind of multiracial allyship around class issues. Um, it's being mobilized really against people of color as the reason, apparently, uh, the white working class people are struggling. So, you know, I, I don't like to speak of it in such disparaging terms as some commentators do in the sense that they attribute this to uneducatedness or, you know, that these people don't know what they're doing and they're just bigots. I think there's deeply pained aspect of the white working class aspect of the United States too, but their politics are completely misguided and are extremely dangerous when it comes to the possibilities of rebuilding our community in the wake of this absolute economic meltdown that's taken place over the past three decades. So yeah, does that, it worries me greatly. Please. You know, during the time of the civil rights struggle, there were two distinct strategies and tactics. One was the nonviolent movement mm -hmm. of Martin Luther King, and the other was the militant black power movement. That's right. Of the two, which do you think was most effective? Yeah, I can't answer that question in a vacuum. I have to answer it in the context of the political opportunities and resources they had. And I see them as movements that were parallel for a period of time, but ultimately the movement I study is a black power movement that followed civil rights. And Cohen, actually, the interesting thing, he had been a devout civil rights activist. He had been a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in Cairo. He staged nonviolent demonstrations at 16 years old at the swimming pool and at other institutions and was very successful in dismantling um, Jim Crow segregation. But when they shifted their focus towards jobs and job equality, uh, they did so and faced significant hostility from whites within the community. And when they did, it also took place in this context of like narrowing political opportunities because of the rise of conservative politics and new right politics. So um, I think the civil rights movement was extraordinarily successful in achieving the narrow aims it set for itself, which was if we're talking about dismantling legalized Jim Crow segregation, they were successful to a significant extent. But if we were to talk about were they successful in actually ending segregation in practice, no, because we see that today actually schools are more segregated in the United States today than they were in 1955. So that's really significant for me. I think there's limits to how successful the civil rights movement was once it moves outside of the legal kind of context. I think black power is a totally different movement in some ways, though there's continuities. And I'm actually most interested in black power because I think it's the movement that's most relevant to today. I actually see a lot of black power politics in the Black Lives Matter movement and in just generally people of color's struggles for rights and empowerment in our own moment, this nadir. Um, and black power is really about something else. Uh, it's a movement that's not about seeking integration into existing institutions. It's not about correcting problems with the black community to deserve inclusion into white America. Uh, it's a movement that's really more about black self-determination, about black pride in their own identity and culture and institutions, and their ability and power to build those institutions for themselves. In fact, there's something quite American about that, right? There's a, a sense of politics here that we can do this for ourselves. Um, and so that politics was limited for the reasons I described. To do that work is actually way more challenging than winning legal cases or getting a few people to change their practices as proprietors at the local level. It involves building a whole separate black set of institutions with virtually no financial ability to do so. Um, and so the goals for that movement, I think, were, were much bigger. Um, and ultimately, they were not successful. That's why we have a Black Lives Matter movement today that's still trying to address those questions in our own moment. Where I think they were successful, uh, and some of us were talking about this uh, the other night when we first arrived in Jackson, was just how different places are where a black power movement has existed in terms of racial self-consciousness. You know, the black folks in places where a black power movement has existed have a sense of pride and sense of self-respect in their own identities and cultures and histories. It's something white folks take for granted. We don't ask always those questions about ourselves. But that is fundamental transformation in African-American history. And I think for that reason, the black power movement has been 
an enormous success in terms of making possible the other kinds of struggles we're seeing today. Does that answer? Thank you. Please. Uh, another compare and contrast question. In terms of the Latino and Hispanic movement, where do you see that movement on um, this trend line that mm -hmm. you described with the black? Mm -hmm. They're very parallel, right? And the American Indian movement at the time with AIM and other groups, they kind of parallel each other. Um, and I think they're facing many of the same challenges, which is that they all operate in the same political context. They're all finding at this point that largely the state is opposed to their interests. And so many of their activists, like many of the activists in the Black Power movement, I guess this is a good place to close, um, is uh, that they're facing not only challenges in mounting the struggles because of lack of resources, but they're facing concerted opposition by state agents. And by that I mean the FBI not just writing letters, but harassing people, getting people arrested on trumped up charges, a pattern of surveillance. Um, and so anybody who was involved in these kinds of struggles of whatever racial group uh, was going to be targeted by law enforcement uh, and by agents of the state. And this made these movements very difficult uh, to win. Um, ultimately, many of these people, including many of the people that I write about in my own book, are incarcerated today as a result. Uh, in fact, Charles Cohen is incarcerated today uh, for the third time. Um, and I met with his wife just a few months before uh, finishing this book. Um, and she's sitting at her dining room table praying that he makes it through this last term in incarceration. Um, so for many people involved in these social justice movements of the 1960s and 70s, those struggles have continued. They've been a part of their day-to-day -day lives or their allies disappeared, right? They have continued to fight for improvements in their communities around education, uh, political power, social institutions, but they have continued to face this threat with the rise of mass incarceration and policing um, to the struggles that they're building in their own communities. So it's a challenge. I think it's a really big challenge, but there are commonalities across each of these groups. Oh.